Is there any other question, any observation? Okay, please go. Yes, it's um, uh, to uh, uh, lecture about uh, uh, lecture of uh, oh thanks uh, lecture of Mr. Torciani that um, it was very impressive for me what uh, he told about uh, the history of Dancona that he was uh, uh, he had to leave uh, Italy only in uh, forty three. And it, it was very impressive for me because uh, uh, as a Central European, I know much more about uh, German stories and, and Central European stories. And in that countries, the Jewish, um, uh, uh, when the Jewish act passed, uh, the universities uh, uh, solved the kicking out of the of the of the scholars. Uh, it's very interesting for me that how is it possible that five uh, years after the Italian Jewish uh, Act, uh, this uh, this um, uh, scholar remained in the uh, position. And my real question that. Is it a typical story? So if we uh, try to see it in prosopographical meaning, so how, how much percent of, uh, of uh, Jewish uh, uh, professors or Jewish scholars uh, remained in the, in the position of Italy? And if, is it, tip it, if it is typical, I have, a, I have another question that, uh, What's happened in the first period of fascism? So what's happened with the, how can I say, anti-fascist professors or exponents of the liberal time of uh, Italy? W were they tolerated uh, as in, in, in position? Thanks. OK. Professor Caradi? Mm. It has been mentioned several times, but I haven't uh, heard about data, if they are uh, uh, quantified data, uh, about teachers and students as well. Well, teachers are more interesting than students. But my question, I have several remarks and questions. One has to do with uh, uh, Dr. Angelini's study on the problem of contemporary history. I think. It's just a footnote. I think in France, in French history, contemporary meant since the 19th century, uh, post-French uh, Revolution history, full stop. So it started much earlier than the 20s. You said that it started in the 20s. I think it had started much earlier. You have modern history up to the French Revolution. You have French Revolution. The history of the revolution itself became a subject under the Republic in the Third Republic. And then you have contemporary ever since, up to 45. And since 45, then came something else, which is called nowadays the present day history, temps présent, okay? So I think the French case is somewhat different, but it has in, in, in impacted a number of local chronologies, especially in Central Europe, in, in, in the historical, in, in the uh, qualification of historical times. Uh, another question has to do with <coughs> uh, with uh, uh, Simone Dinder's uh, thesis, um, stating, if I understood you well, that there is a strong connection between this new type of conception of cultural citizenship and uh, English uh, American universities. Uh, now, how does it that is teaching democracy to ever larger groups of youngsters. Uh, how, and you, you, you stress the fact that this idea became very strong in the, in the Cold War period. Uh, yes, it had antecedents in the, uh, in the interwar years, but it became a strong idea in the interwar years. So my question is simply, 
How does it square with the McCartism, which is another type of very strong ideological and administrative reaction to the Cold War situation? How does it square with the anti-Jewish numerous clauses in Ivy League colleges up to the 60s? How does it square with the very selective admission of black people into the good universities, not in special ghetto universities, but into the good universities? So how does it work? And one more remark. You wondered what happened in Europe in this, uh, in this context, that is, whether there were uh, uh, efforts to uh, take over the, 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 the American example or produce some local forms of uh, training citizens in universities. I tell you that in the Soviet realm, it has been done on a wide scale, and uh, it was generalized to the extent that in the early 50s, when I started my university studies in, uh, under the Soviet regime in Budapest, we had one third of all our classes dedicated to ideological social science. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a, a, a question by uh, Hans Martin, please. Okay, the first question goes to Margherita Angelini. Um, I think you, um, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, Croce saying that uh, the fascist period was a parenthesis in, in Italian history. I'm not quite sure what that's supposed to mean. I'm, I, I, the way I understood it was sort of an exception to the continuous great history of the Italian people. I mean, that sounds like something that any uh, established German historian could have said between at least 45 and 60. Any university-based German historian from the conservative mainstream, I think, would have said the same thing. The Betriebsunfall der deutschen Geschichte, the, 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 you know, it was just an accident within German history that really doesn't really properly belong to German history, the whole fascist period. Um, which brings me to my question, um, if, there isn't, if there wasn't sort of a, a white elephant in, in the room in your, in your talk, which is Eastern Germany, um, because you kept rightly, I think, uh, on, your, on your slides, you said Western Germany, Federal Republic of Germany, um, isn't the existence of, the parallel existence of Eastern Germany with its, with its very fundamental critique, uh, criticism of fascism sort of written into the system, doesn't that condition what happens in Western Germany? to a large degree, because, you know, um, this comes, of course, you know, I say, of course, indirectly from a comparison to Japan, where you have a similar situation to begin with, but you don't have an Eastern Japan. So there's actually a quite strong Marxist uh, minority, or I don't know if it's even a minority, Marxist strand in the universities that criticize Japanese history, Japanese state, that, that make fascism a topic. So, and that, my understanding has always been that has not happened in Germany in the, in the first, let's say, two decades after the war because they had the, the, the Cold War opponent there that took care of that and they had to sort of polish German history in a, in a different way and, and sort of there was a division of labor uh, across the Iron Curtain and um, that was not the case in, in it, Japan. So I'm wondering how did it work out in Italy, you know, where again you do not have the, the, uh, the, the Marxist opponent right across uh, the, the in international border, so to speak. Um, the other comment is for uh, Simone Dinder. Um, I appreciated that paper very much. Um, and um, to be quite honest, the, the, your chronology confused me a bit. Um, you started out with, with Kerr in 63. Um, and then, then you said, well, actually, that was all before the war. And you came with Dewey and all of that. And I found that extremely convincing because of course it ties into what I said this morning, that these uh, American occupationaires who are people from regional universities, mostly I think, I forget, um, I have to look it up. I think uh, the, the main person who comes up with this outline uh, of, the, of the proposed uh, law that comes up with the governing boards, I think he's from Virginia somewhere. Um, um, and I think that they're certainly part of that discourse that, that you know, speaks about citizen responsibility um, in, in a regional context to be nurtured by universities, and that's something that they want to transplant to the Japanese context. So you have that, you have all the, the Dewey and all of that um, in, in the 20s um, and 30s, but then you, you, have, you go again to the post-war and have this social engineering bit, and I think your examples were again more from the... 60s, the Chicago school, uh, um, 
That's earlier, right? Okay. But so I'm, I'm wondering if you can clear, clear that up a bit. Perhaps I'm, I'm just too much of the, of the historian who needs the, the rigid chronology and you're, you're more fluid here, but I, w I was a bit confused. What is actually new after 45? What is not? Or, or in the 60s? Um, and um, this ties in a bit to um, something that uh, Luigi Aurelio Pomante has said, as far as I could tell it from the English uh, version in writing, which is that, um, from the way I understood it, that there is this experiment with the, with the regional, um, with, with tying at least the one university you talked about, Macerata, to, to regional society and to, say, agricultural science that would be important for the region. And I was wondering if that's a, a really just an exception at that time, or whether that was just one of several examples, whether that was discussed broadly in Italy, perhaps, to, to have these ties between the regional society and the provincial universities, and whether there's some sort of parallel here, perhaps, to what we can see, you know, what I refer to as part of the American model this morning, um, which sounds like something that, for example, in Germany, I don't, I don't think that has ever been discussed uh, in, in this fashion at all. I mean, uh, there are no small provincial universities, perhaps, uh, and certainly not in, not in Japan. People, as I said, were opposed to this. Um, and this finally brings me to your final three questions. And uh, I'd be very pessimistic. The way you did phrase them about cultural administrators interested in fostering a democratic cultural citizenship, I, I wouldn't see this at all until the 1960s. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think... German universities certainly were, were bastions of exactly the, the opposite, I think. Uh, I don't think they, they are necessarily uh, pillars of, of the new democracy. Uh, they're really elite institutions that are very conservative, by and large. And if you look at the, the icons of democracy that emerge after 45, they're all outside of the university, um, people from, from the general public, I think. But maybe the, the actual experts on German history um, would, would have something more concrete to say on this. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Let's have a break in the general discussion. All the speakers uh, might like to answer the questions, and um, I think it's better. Let's respect the agenda and uh, begin with the doc Dr. Pomante. Thank you. The Gentile perspective was based uh, on a rigidly idea of uh, university. A gentile, a Croce, and neo-idealist group. Neo group. Uh, for uh, Gentile, a small university were a burden for the state and uh, is necessary uh, a slow end. A slow end for Macerata, Sassari, Pavia, and other small university. But uh, uh, the, 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 the slow end for Macerata is impossible from uh, Mr. Minister Matteucci, Minister Martini, uh, Minister Croce uh, tried to uh, uh, kill the small university, <laughs> but uh, not possible in Italy. And uh, uh, Gentile uh, think that uh, the solution was the specialization. Specialization was uh, um, a solution for continuity and stability of the small university. Small university. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the small university was a uh, hard university that uh, had a, a role small in the system, in the university system, non a uh, uh, little town, okay? Because it's um, a difficult uh, element uh, to um, distinguish. To difference, okay? And uh, Macerata, in uh, 10 years, uh, tried uh, continuity and uh, sustainability, but uh, with the Vecchi, uh, the um, situation uh, was uh, better because uh, Macerata uh, had, uh, had money, but no autonomy. Okay? Okay, thank you. So, um, Francesco Torchiani, please. 
uh, uh, first of all, uh, I would uh, I would thank uh, our guests for uh, their um, for their observations. Um, Professor uh, Martin uh, has shown us how my paper needs to um, uh, uh, further. Um, um, it needs a um, sort of uh, um, comparison, more, more comparison uh, for um, to be uh, developed. And um, I would also thank our guests for uh, their, um, uh, their words. Uh, you have touched a, a topic uh, which, uh, um, with your question on uh, the exact uh, numbers of uh, um, Jewish scholars who uh, left Italy, uh, you have touched a, a topic uh, which um, has known a um, um, growing uh, interest uh, within the Italian histori in historiographic uh, uh, debate. Um, for my PhD dissertation, I had the opportunity uh, to uh, work on the biographies of some of those uh, scholars, um, in, especially for uh, the Jewish, uh, Jewish professors who uh, left Italy for the United States. Um, we don't know uh, um, exactly how many uh, Italian um, Jews uh, left Italy. Um, some recent articles um, uh, report, uh, report the uh, number of uh, two thousands uh, for a population which is um, of uh, 40,000 um, people. And, um, but we also know that uh, 400 of um, uh, 400 uh, professors and, uh, and assistants and people uh, in the universities uh, were um, dismissed from university. Uh, were dismissed from university, but. In uh, this number of uh, um, men and women and, and childs who left Italy after the 1938, we don't know how many uh, intellectuals there were among uh, those people. Uh, because, um, first of all, because it's, it, it, it is difficult to um, give a, a, an exact definition of uh, intellectual. Uh, many. Um, Mm, many people who uh, were j journalists or uh, um, functionaries in museums and at the same time there were scholars or, or art historians um, as well as their uh, colleagues in universities uh, left Italy at, in, in, the same, in the same way. Um, then, uh, for the intellectual migration, uh, for the, the, the first half for, of your uh, question, uh, we have two turning points, uh, f um, which um, I have tried to, to sketch uh, in my paper. The first one is uh, um, the, um, the halt, which is imposed by the fascist government in 1931, and only a few uh, number of professors uh, refused to uh, take this uh, halt. And among uh, those um, among those scholars, um, only uh, um, only a few um, took the way of the exile. Uh, Lionello Venturi. Um, um, who, uh, who uh, were dismissed by uh, the University of Turin, uh, was one of the greatest uh, art historians of his time, and he left Italy uh, in, uh, at the beginning of 19, 1932 for Paris, uh, where he, um, he lived thanks to uh, conferences, lectures, and thanks to his uh, uh, activity of uh, uh, concert, um, thanks to um, his consulship. Um, I don't know. I don't remember if there were. Uh, no. Sorry. Or more questions for you? There were more questions. I think yes. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Francesco, and uh, now uh, Margherita, please, Margherita Angelini. Thank you. Does it work? Yeah. Um, so I wanted to 
to thank the discussant, Ignazio Pedro Martin, for his uh, observations. And um, yes, I wanted to say I am completely um, <laughs> aware of the fact that I have to count uh, also all the chairs, the Cathedra of uh, History or Zeitgeschichte, and I will certainly do that. And I'm also aware that there's different state models, university models, uh, the problem of uh, the influence, for example, of the American uh, um, the Americans in West Germany and uh, the problem of uh, how they influence education reforms in Italy. Uh, there is a, maybe a longer influence in Germany than in Italy because there's different university models and uh, because Germany is a federal state with uh, more aut autonomy and uh, Italy was a centralized state but uh, I mean now uh, this is not maybe the occasion to discuss all of this but I, I appreciate very much uh, all of uh, the observations and I will try to uh, <laughs> Put them in my paper, and um, okay, yes, uh, uh, France. Uh, it's uh, your observation was right. Uh, as I said, uh, the concept of contemporary history is a very fluid concept. Uh, Zeitgeschichte in Germany uh, at the moment is uh, the history after 1945. There was a large debate as I, I tried to su summarize. In Italy, uh, Storia Contemporanea traditionally is the 19th and 20th century. So as I was trying to point out uh, the differences, uh, the in the different countries, European and non-European countries, tell us a lot of what uh, is perceived as the nation's modernity. So it's obviously interesting to uh, understand why there are these differences. And doing a comparative history does not mean finding all the similarities, but just to try to single out uh, national uh, specificities in a more broad context. So obviously I will try to do also that. The problem of East Germany, uh, certainly uh, the first uh, um um, the first historian who, talk, who talked about f uh, um, Nazism in um, Germany was Alexander Abusch in 1946, who uh, stigmatized uh, the German um, history as a history of disasters. Uh, but his interpretations as the interpretation of Meinecke in West Germany, uh, but especially Abu's interpretation, was immediately dubbed as the history of misery because the communists understood that if their new social identity was built on a negative view of the German history, uh, then it would have not worked. So, um, Abush, uh, Abush's um, interpretation was uh, marginalized and uh, um, the socialist uh, state uh, constructed a history uh, of uh, the contemporary, the very contemporary history um, so of the Nazi period as a history as uh, um, uh, them being victims of a fascist and capitalist state. Uh, at the same time, it's not an exception, as I was trying to demonstrate. Meinecke, in uh, Die Deutsche Katastrophe, uh, also uh, tried to uh, demonstrate that the, the, the German traditions brought to the disaster of Nazism. But at the same time, in the 1950s, Meinecke was an exception. So what does it differ from the Italian case study when I was talking about Croce? Croce was uh, of uh, Meineke, well, uh, he was of, of uh, another generation, and his interpretation had a long-lasting um, life in Italy. And uh, so the difference with Germany, as I was trying to say, was that uh, the international pressures brought historians in Germany very early, or earlier than in Italy, to re-see this uh, uh, interpretation of uh, fascism and nationalism as a parenthesis 
but obviously it's a very complex problem. As it is very complex in Italy, the role of the Communist Party and those historians who uh, were near to the, uh, to the Communist Party and that uh, obviously didn't have the big elephant near in their own country, but they had it just near them in Yugoslavia or in other... Uh, yes, it, 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 I know, it's, it's difficult to understand from, a, um, how can you say, from outside, but I mean, it's, it's, very, it's a very complicated story. And I hope I can answer to all of these things, not in my paper, but in my future book. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, uh, Margherita. And now, uh, at um, Simone, I would like to add one short question for you. Uh, I was wondering if a new, new university, like the New School for Social Research, founded in 1919, uh, could have been a case study for your research. My question is uh, connected with uh, Andrea's observations. And um, I was thinking, uh, uh, of, um, especially of uh, Anna Arendt and her role in some of the most important American public discussions you know, of the, of the period you considered. So, that's okay, thank you very much. It's not on. Oh, it's on. Oh. Uh, thank all of you for your questions. Um, I will start with Andrea's question about the emigres. Um, actually, uh, that's a paragraph that I took out of my paper because I uh, had, because of a lack of time. Um, but yes, uh, they were very important um, for a number of reasons. Um, they, uh, in the 1930s when they arrived, they tended to be, uh, the, the social scientists among them, they tended to be interested in the topic of totalitarianism, how does it work, uh, how, does a, uh, how does a people turn uh, total, uh, into a totalitarian society, um, how does persuasion work, uh, propaganda studies. So they were interested in the subject um, uh, of these new projects into private informal politics. Um, they also uh, were very important in translating uh, uh, media of propaganda from German uh, into English uh, for those scholars, American scholars who were, were already working on this. Um, mostly in the 1930s when the study of propaganda really took off in the United States. Um, and third, um, as they were interested in the subject of uh, living together in a democratic society, how does that work? How can we make sure that the next uh, German society is, um, is a democratic society? What can we do f to, to help the society think more democratically? Um, they often introduced uh, European theory, uh, social theory. Um, I, I, I dare say that from the 1920s uh, through the 1930s, the scholars who were most influential in the fields that I'm studying, uh, labor relations, uh, persuasion, communication studies, um, power relations within the family, within the church, all of these, uh, were scholars who had either were Americans who had been uh, uh, in Germany for a, a year uh, as exchange scholars, or they were uh, emigres. So they were very important, and um, uh, well, they they are definitely uh, in my uh, chapter and in my paper. It's a very good point. Um, second, oh, the new school. Uh, the new school was mostly about theory. That's why uh, I haven't studied it because it didn't have a Bureau of Social Research, as the other universities had, um, but scholars like uh, Hannah Arendt were um, often invited to those public lecture series or book series um, uh, to shine their light on the big debate of uh, democracy and the future of intergroup cohabitation. And in fact, Arendt's uh, The Human Condition started off as a series of lectures at the Walgreen, um, uh, Walgreens uh, series on American institutions. And Walgreens is the, is the famous pharmacy chain in the US. And uh, very interested in uh, what Arendt had to say about uh, democracy. So, uh, so they were involved, but not through uh, uh, research projects, more theoretically. 
Um, then I'll go to your question about uh, um, chronology. Um, you're right, my paper wasn't cr uh, chronological, so I went back and forth a little bit. Um, but what I'm meaning to say is that uh, there is a development discernible in the American social sciences. It starts in the 1920s of investigating uh, democratic behavior or political behavior in small settings, in, in, in groups, in small groups, rather than in the nation. It starts in the 20s, but it really takes off. It's, it's propelled into a big uh, uh, undertaking after World War II because uh, there is an enormous amount of government funding uh, during the war, uh, propaganda, morale studies, uh, those kinds of things. Um, and with that money, uh, huge uh, departments are being founded and they continue in the uh, 50s and uh, 60s. So, uh, so it's something that starts and that's small and becomes very big and prominent after the war. And because of that, a lot of historians have said it didn't start until after the war, but that's not true. The, the ideas, the seeds of that development were already there. So that's the chronology. That makes sense. Okay. And uh, your question, very, a very good question, um, a very important question. Uh, why all this talk about edu education and science for democracy when there are at that same time uh, so many people being excluded and there's McCarthyism? Um, my answer is that uh, sometimes what administrators said did not always correspond with what they had to do in their daily practice. So. Um, from this trend, the outcome from this trend that is, that is positive, or at least that's something that was achieved, uh, are those research centers, research centers with uh, survey uh, techniques, surveying the average American, uh, that's one. And two, um, a lot of efforts in informing the greater public. So uh, scholars like Hannah Arendt were very visible all of a sudden in the media. Um, Scholars would all of a sudden appear in Life magazine, for example, which is considered a, a democratization of uh, the university because it's more present in people's, on people's ta uh, coffee tables, for example. But at the same time, uh, um, admission to the university did not get better. Uh, in fact, Clark Kerr, the man who was uh, the, the major spokesperson for the instrumental and democratic university, uh, struck down on uh, um, student uh, protests later in the 1960s very harshly, was not in favor of uh, a more democratic, de democratic government in his own institution. Um, he and his colleagues cooperated with um, investigations um, of McCarthy, uh, anti-communist investigations, uh, checking out whether colleagues were or had been members of communist parties. Uh, it was it was done with a certain uh, protest under debate, but still they 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 didn't refuse to do it. So uh, there is a there is a gap. There's a discrepancy between what's being said and how it actually plays out. Thank you very much, Simona. And now, uh, Professor Kikbi, I would like to add a question. Uh, what was the situation of Australian female uh, university students before the Second World War? Just if you can tell us something, okay? Before the Second World War. Um, very small minority. Yeah. Um, I think. PhDs. Uh huh. Um, but uh, Australian women start going to university in 1880. Um, so, you know, some things are very good for Australian women. We get, you know, Australian women get the vote very early um, and they start going to university, but they, not in large numbers. And a very small minority are teaching in universities. Um, but again, not they're not in the same numbers as the American women. And Australia doesn't have a system of women's colleges, separate women's universities, which seems to be what is the big attraction for women in the post-war period. That's where they're going, Smith College, Wesley College, these colleges where there are an abundance of women 
and once women decide to go there to study, they of course encounter all kinds of other experiences and that's what I'm interested in. Is that That's what's opening them up to a new um, and more radical ways of thinking. Okay, thank you very much. Any further question, observation? Okay. Ah. I, it, it, wasn't, ah. it wasn't a Fulbright, but I went to Smith College for a year, uh, uh, a program switch. that had... It's on? The microphone? Oh, it's on? It's on. Okay. It's on. Okay. I went to Smith College in 2006. It was a program that had come into existence during the Cold War as a means to um, let women from Europe Western Europe get to know American culture and uh, at Smith College, so that's why it's uh, so interesting for me. It's very interesting to do that comparison or that um, uh, transnational study of, I mean, I've only looked at Australia, but I'm actually developing a project which will be looking at other countries as well in relation to the Fulbright program. And these... Um, exchange programs are receiving a lot of attention now from scholars. There's a big conference on Fulbright actually in Arkansas next year exploring his ideas and this program internationally. Um, I think somebody said that there had been more movement of people under the Fulbright program since the time of um, uh, you know, ancient, ancient times and so on. So it's just been a massive relocation I suppose or just transfer of people and ideas. Um, so, yeah. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> oh. Okay. Clarification for Martin. Uh, really, in Italy, uh, the first division between uh, university big and small, uh, there was uh, 100 years before Gentile, uh, with a, a bill, a pontifical bill, uh, Quod Divina Sapientia, uh, Leon XII, uh, uh, university maiores et minores, maiores uh, Rome and Bologna, minores Macerata, Urbino, Papal State, Papal State, no, Italy. Ok, ok. <laughs> uh, maior, maiores uh, Rome and Bologna, minores Macerata, Urbino, Camerino, Perusia and Ferrara. Okay, any further question? Observation? I could just say yes. one word to continue this very important problem. Uh, that is a problem of small and big universities because in many countries of Europe you have networks of universities and you have a dominant, domineering university. Sorry. And I, I think it, it works. It works well. Okay. And well, the typical counterpart to Italy would be France, but the big difference is that in Italy you had a historically developed very large network of universities, the biggest in Europe, to my knowledge. That is, by the Risorgimento, you had just the largest network of universities in the whole continent, compared to Germany, to France, to any of the, to Habsburg monarchy, you had just the largest network. So the problem was, what to do with this very large network which had not much to do, I mean functionally it was not really f working, I mean it was not functional. Now the French had similar, a similar situation but it was built up on a very different basis, that is the Napoleonic state decided, Napoleon himself, who was quite, a, quite an intellectual, decided to build up the university as the state administration. So it was a kind of state bureaucracy. Hence, you had 16 uh, so-called academies, that is, educational departments. So you needed 16 universities, which were not called universities, which were called groups of faculties, because there was no university in France up to the end of the 19th century. But the idea was to have an administrative body of teachers with faculties and lycées, and then additionally you had central institutions for doing the real job, that is basically the grandes écoles, the specialized schools of the state, then the research institutions, for example the museum, the biological research institution, 
which was teaching, both teaching and doing research. And then came the other new research institutions, like in uh, 1868, the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales, which became a major instance of the French scientific effort. But it goes back to the 19th century. Anyhow, the local universities did not have any local function in the system. So contrary to what happened in Italy, where local universities had to have something to do with the local elites, local needs, and local, possibly, uh, academies, that is, intellectual groups. In France, nothing of that sort. They were parts of a big centralized state administration, the only emerging functional piece of which was just Paris, the Sorbonne. That was the only functioning. The rest didn't count. If I can give you just an example for this, you had doctor's degree in French universities. Among the do those taking a doctorate in uh, letters and sciences, that is, in the faculties of letters and sciences, some 85% of doctorates were taken in Paris up to the end of the 19th century because that was the only thing that counted. Local doctorates didn't count a bit. So the situation was very, well, similar to some extent, but very different. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any further question, observation? Okay, so thank you everyone for a very lively discussion.